Hello, everybody. My name is Joe. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Hey, Joe. Welcome to the Tuesday night Big Book Study um, with uh, Tony, myself, and Kim tonight reading. Uh, Joanne couldn't be with us. She's doing district. Uh, I think she's doing district stuff tonight. Um, this is not your normal uh, AA meeting. We'll be facilitating a Big Book Study. We'll be going through the first portion of the AA recovery program as outlined in our basic text. Um, what we're going to do tonight is Kim's going to put up uh, things for the remote communities and other information. Uh, myself and other members of our Big Book Study will be posting up their emails to get involved more with the sheets. I'll also be putting... more involved with uh, furthering your knowledge of the big book after doing the sheets. Uh, we have a lot of talks on the YouTube channel. Um, how we usually open this meeting is with the set-aside prayer. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my illness, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. And tonight we're going to get into a pretty heavy-duty chapter tonight, um, right now, and uh, I'll post it up there. We're going to be on page 44. We're in the chapter, uh, We Agnostics, and Tony, it's, uh, take it away. Right on. Recovered Alcoholic. My name's Tony. Uh, sobriety dates April 8, 1989. Thanks for joining us and allowing us in your homes. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this stuff. You know, in, in, in step three and step 11, it says, God as we understand him. There's, there's a common understanding that they had and that they all agreed on. When we started this thing back into uh, uh, the forwards, it talked about, we have Alcoholics Anonymous for more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So what happens is it's telling you, Right there, that they all agree on what the problem is, what the solution is, and what the course of action is, and the basis of that. So we agnostics explains what we mean by the solution and just what do we mean by accessing this thing. So we're going to kind of start off at the top here and kind of see what the preceding chapters were for, right? Anybody know what the preceding chapters were for up to this point in time? You could kind of put it in. But the book always answers itself, and Kimberly will be with us tonight, so it's pretty good. We'll, we'll read the first chapter, I mean the first paragraph, and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. So, have they done that? Have they made a clear distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic? What was the preceding chapters for? To learn something of alcoholism. Have we learned something of alcoholism? What did we learn from alcoholism? Is that there's two symptoms. Is there any more symptoms than the two symptoms that they've talked about? No. Does the fellowship talk about a whole bunch of different symptoms? So well, if you're new coming into the fellowship, it'd be very confusing to what is alcoholism? What's a behavioral problem? What's this? What's that? And the other thing. And they're going to clarify what we've learned in the other chapters. They're going to break it down to, to its kind of common denominator or basic understanding. Go ahead. The biggest Sorry. word in the book is if. If. I'm typing at the same time. <laughs> no, no, just spit out the gum. <laughs> no. <laughs> People are asking me questions. Okay. If. When you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. Okay, or so what, well, we'll bring it slowly. So what symptom is that? Everybody can put that, their answer in the chat if they would like to. So you want to read that again? The biggest word in the book is if. Go if, ahead. when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. So what symptom is that, people? The first symptom or the second symptom? Show, show, you, show your fingers, not the middle one, though. So we're getting a lot of, uh, it's a, it's really mixed up here. So we're getting the malady, the obsession, second, first. So a lot, of, a lot of confusion. Okay, so in alcoholism, what did they say the second symptom was? Was it the malady or the obsession? Said it was the malady, right? We found that on page 23 in Nate Bill. The obsession isn't one of the characteristics or isn't one of the um, symptoms that the book describes as 
and characteristic with alcoholism. So here they're talking about the malady. If I honestly want to, I find I cannot quit entirely, right? So that means stay stop. From the time I made the decision to stop, did I pick up again? Anybody like that here? So there's, so that's talking about the malady, my inability to stay stopped based on my own experience, right? That we read about on page 23, that we confirmed on page 24, that they talked about in page 33 to 43, was this condition that centers in the mind, right? And the second symptom? Or if, when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic so if you have little control over the amount you take what symptom is that that's first symptom that's the allergy and where did we learn that from who did we learn that from was the doctor he gave us the terminology of the allergy right the, and they talk about from it stems the phenomenon of craving so the phenomenon of craving happens before or after we drink after. after so if you think about it can you have a craving for alcohol if you stand too close to it, the only way to have a physical reaction or allergy or to trigger the phenomenon of craving is to ingest it. Everybody agree with that? So if we never picked up the first drink, we'd never trigger the allergy. So the main problem of the alcoholic center is where? In his mind rather than in his body, right? So it goes on to say, then it kind of says, if that be the case... You may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. And who's the first person that gave us reference to that? He called it a psychic change, though. It, again, it was the doctor based on his observation on people who was conflicted with his illness, right? In his treatment facility, he realized that most of the people he dealt with was able, he was able to treat with his conventional means and, and kind of working on themselves and adjustment a behavior adjustment and all that other stuff. But there was another group of people that was outside his scope or outside his realm. W would you say that there, Joe? I would say that 100%. And so what he witnessed was upon this guy who went into his facility upon a third time, he acquired some information that he put in into a application and he had this psychic change or spiritual experience. So if you're at this stage of the game, you've learned... You know what type of alcoholic you are. You're either beyond human aid or you can keep yourself sober. If you're still participating, you're probably beyond human aid and you probably need this this kind of this solution. Especially if you're the alcoholic who kept on relapsing and doing acts against themselves at three years, two years, six months. You keep on finding yourself drinking again based on in spite of all the efforts you do not to. In spite of all the meetings, all the treatment, all, all the working on self and, and exerting self. And they'll kind of explain why self won't be sufficient enough to fix self. Like, you know, surrender, acceptance, you know, these acts that we hear people talk about in meetings. And we go, if I could just achieve this acceptance or this surrender or this one act, then I'll be able to recover from this thing that's killing me. Here they're saying, mm, the only thing that's going to save you from you at this stage of the game is an entire psychic change or spiritual experience, right? And they'll go on to qualify that. To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. True, eh? It's like, oh, how am I going to get this thing? So the intellect kicks in. What's our first obsession? Ourselves. Anybody have an argument with that? We may be... Not we may be not much, but we're all we think about, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> like, our first obsession is to fix ourselves with self. Anybody have that delusion here? So that's the first thing that needs to be smashed, is there's something beyond my capability of fixing based on my own efforts. Why do I keep on returning to the trough all the time, right? Because I have a, an illness. I don't have a behavioral problem, right? That's the first thing that needs to be smashed is the idea that I could fix this on my own resources. How many people have been there being convinced? Awesome. Well, why keep the suspense going? Let's see what happens. Do we want to define what an atheist or agnostic is for people or does everyone understand that? Well, you'll know where you are in that. <laughs> All right. But both, you notice both of them have the same problem. Mm -hmm. And the true believer has the same. Because the guy back on page 27, when he talked about this spiritual experience, he kind of felt comforted that he was a church member. So he was a true believer. So all three of them were having the same problem. 
What are all three of them having the same problem with? Faith. Well, it's not faith because the guy the guy had faith. The guy on page twenty seven had faith. Yeah, it's it's their where they're putting their uh, belief. So so right away we, we see three of these guys are having the same problem, right? And as, as part of yeah, it's the belief system. But they'll so they need to go on to explain why are all these people having a problem. So let us explain what we mean by the solution. Right, because it seems to be accessible to all these people that went before you. How can we make it accessible to you, especially if you're the type that needs to get this experience, but your thinking's getting in the way of it? Bill was like that, was he not? Bill was a believer. He talked about the pledge he signed and all that other stuff and all this. So he was kind of how many people here have been believers and thought, oh, I believe in God, but still not be able to get sober. Anybody here reeking of alcohol, talking to God? So we see there's got to be something more to this. How many people came in AA and say, oh, God, go right to the God card, and then still not be able to get so. So there's something that I'm missing here in their understanding what they mean by this solution, and that's where they're going to start to explain that. Did you want to say something, Joe? No, I was just, you were, you were segueing right into it, and I was talking about how, how Bill there had had those certain same um, ideas in regards to when Eddie was presenting to it, but he was still interested in what his friend had to say. So it kind of pushed aside what he what he was holding on to, and it kind of opened him up to putting a lot of belief into what Eddie was presenting to him at the time, right? Yeah, okay. Hit us up there, Kim. But to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed an alcoholic death or so to what, live So on what, what step is that? Face. Step one. Step one, right? So we know what it means to be doomed to an alcoholic death and the inability to get sober based on our experience because of the malady that centers in the mind, right? So now they're going to talk about the same thing, which which is the solution, right? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. We're, we're the only group of people who think that's a hard decision. Here, let me think about that. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or, or to... Live on the spiritual basis of life that all these people found happy, contented, happy, joyous, and free. Can can I take a week to think about this? You know, like remember the doctor said we're little maladjusted, full flight from reality, downright mental defectives. Most people would jump at the idea. So you're gonna die a horrific death, or you could practice a bit of spiritual principles to give you a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. Well, let me see. Anyways, go ahead. But it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were of exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. Meaning, meaning what? A lot of us are hoping against hope we're not true alcoholics. Even those examples, that guy in the book. Thanks for the information. After what you told me, it can't happen again. What can't happen again? Relapse. Maybe I don't have this malady. Maybe I just have the obsession. Because the obsession I could smash and I could take care of. But this malady places me beyond human aid. Right? The, the second symptom that they talk about in the book places me beyond human aid. Now I'm in trouble. Yeah. But after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or out. Perhaps it is going to be that way with you. But cheer up. Something like half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics. Our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we have found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. What is that, Joe? Sorry? Why is that? Why did they fail utterly? Because of the two symptoms of alcoholism. 
Yeah, so why doesn't this stuff work? Like, you know, how, what, what are some of the things we use in the fellowship that are along those guidelines? Just for today, don't pick up. If you don't pick Leave up makers, the first one, you're drunk. Put the plug in the jug. Just keep coming back. Wait for the miracle to happen. Turn it over. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems. Just for today, tell yourself. Wake up. Remind yourself. Step one. All this self stuff don't work. If you're of this type, you're doomed. You're doomed. Doomed ain't a, a pleasant word. It means you're you're <laughs> you're on your way to being 86, and you're the only one that doesn't know it yet. And that's and that's yeah. what failed. You ever go to the ATM and it says insufficient funds, and you start getting mad at the ATM? Yeah, I, I see all you guys laughing. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, you guys know that one, right? Two in the morning. Ah, where's my money? So insufficient. Yeah. yeah. So they're saying that we. It's not that we haven't tried these things. How many working on ourselves? I'm working on this defect. I'm working on that defect. I'm working on me. I'm working my program. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm I'm self based recovery. Anybody have that? And if you didn't know the difference, you'd think that stuff works. That's why they're educating you here. Why it doesn't work? Why can't because we can't bring about this change that they talk about this psychic change or spiritual experience. Right? Why is that? So the book qualifies it, and it doesn't leave us hanging. And why is that, Kim? Kimberly? Lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? That, that's a good, that's well, a good that, question, that, right? That's a lot of people. So when you come into fellowship, everybody tells you, am I lagging here or am I sounding okay? Good. Good. So what happens is before people even understand what the problem is or even been through the book, we start telling them, well, choose your own conception. Build your own conception of God. Choose your own understanding what you think the solution is. Well, that's not what the book is saying. The book is saying... There's, we have a specific problem, lack of power to create this change. It didn't say because a lot of us have belief. A lot of us know the Bible quite well. A lot of us are church going. A lot of us are kind of have this dilemma. Why can't I rebuild my life? How many people here has tried to rebuild their life? How many people really felt that they were going somewhere and then the illness was lying dormant and then it represented itself and you found yourself drinking again? How many people here has been baffled? At why this keep happening? How many people go to a meeting and the people around you are baffled? Right? And they try to give you behavior modification stuff. Just do this. Just do this. Well, this stuff don't work. I need a specific solution to a specific problem. Right? So what happens is they talk about where and how were we to find this power. I need the psychic change. So what do we see what they mean by that? Because have they asked you what you, what you think so far? No. Have they gone, well, we've explained it. What do you think? No, because we need to understand what they're talking. Remember, in the preceding chapter, we've learned something of alcoholism. We learned what the problem is. We've learned what the solution is. We learned that they took a course of action to bring this about. We, we are about to embark on that, but we have certain ideas or prejudice or certain conceptions that are getting in the way of the pursuit of that, or we try to bypass this. So they're saying, let's explain more in detail what we mean by this. So if we go to the spiritual appendix in the back of the book, it'll take away all the guessing, right? Page this will, five, Page 567. This will explain exactly what they mean by a second change or spiritual experience that we can't bring about on our own power or our own effort. It's something that they also talked about is a phenomenon. It's an unexplainable event that seems been happening since the beginning of time. And this doctor witnessed that, that these people got access to this thing that did the impossible. So it's hard to explain, but you see it happening all around us. Right? So that's why they say, here's an example of it. Do you believe if you do what these people did, you'd get what they got? Right? The evidence is clear. But we need to navigate you through your thinking so you can see what we're talking about and get over what you're thinking and what your ideas are. So what's a spiritual experience, Kim? The terms spiritual experience and a spiritual awakening are used many times in this book which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. 
Yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety, because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. <laughs> I like that, right? Because most of us, we get a little sober. We're trying to convince everybody how much we've changed, right? You know, yeah. I've really changed. I mean it this time. I know I was lying all the other, but this time I mean it. Like, yeah, can you see? And we try to convince people we changed, and then they start believing us, and then we ask them for another 20 bucks. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but, so when, when we change... They'll know we've changed. People around us know us better than we know us, right? How many people around you have been concerned for you long before you were concerned for you? Right? So people around us know. So when Ebby showed up at Bill's door, did Bill, did Ebby need to convince Bill how much he changed? No. And those two examples of the guys that the doctor used in the book, he talked about this vast change. One guy, he could hardly bring himself to know that he knew him. So this change, when it happens, it talks about, so what we're doing is the educational variety too. By the time we finish this, you will experience some form of spiritual experience or psychic change as the result of this course of action, sufficient enough for you to recover. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path, but you need to thoroughly follow the path, and you need to understand it. Go ahead, sorry. He finally realized that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. And why can't we afford years of self-discipline to bring about this change? Why can't most of us get that duration of time? No cause. Yeah, so if we could go periods of time, months or years, which some people can because they don't, their brains and bodies weren't as damaged as some of us, but the alcoholic would hardly an exception will be able to outlast themselves sufficient enough to, to apply themselves long enough to have this change over a long period of time. So here they're saying what well, usually takes place in a few months, not eight days, not 30 days, a few months of application. Later on when we get into this, are we willing to meet our creditors and people from our past? Have we found peace? Have we found the promises? Are they internally happening sufficient enough that I'm experiencing these things, no longer talking about these things, right? And is the people around me noticing these things are happening? That's where the true, true part of this comes in. Go ahead, sir. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. So are they all having the same experience? Is everybody yeah. who's gone through this and have experienced a second chance experience, spiritual experience, are they all having the same experience? We've got a couple of people said no, one said yes. So want to read that again? Was hardly an exception? With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. At the top, it talks about, right, that we've tapped into an inner resource, a power greater than ourselves. Remember what they talked about? What's this book about? What's the main purpose of this book now? Power. To enable us to find a power greater than ourselves. Where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's what this book is about. So if I follow their lead and do what they did based on their understanding and their experience and application of the same things, will I have the same experience that they're talking about here? How I explain that, I call it a frequency. Some people may call it a, a whatever. 
how how it's personal to me is the same for all of us. And then a resource, okay? So, guy, can I just answer yep. a, or a couple of things alluding to the chat? So, a lot of confusion. Yes, whether or not they choose their own conception, we're not even at that point yet. What we're discussing is that presently, all of them who've gone through this course of action have tapped an under suspected inner resource. They all went through the same thing as what they're saying. This this process. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our process. What they chose to call the deity or whatever they want to call it was personal to them. How they experienced was on a collective level through the same solution. So it's not depends. It's not well. It's personal. No, it's all it's all uh, collective. It's all the same. How you've experienced it will be different, but it's the same process is what they're trying to say here. With, with few exceptions, our members find they have tapped in an unsuspected inner resource which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than ourselves. What's our dilemma? Lack of power. Some of us or all of us? All of us. All of us have the same problem. So we all need the same solution. What's the same solution that we all need? This course of action. Well, you know, a power greater than ourselves. So whether I call it Jesus Christ, Muhammad, uh, that's my own personal right. It has, it's none of our business. But the same for all of us is I need to access a power sufficient enough to create a change within my psyche that they talk about here in order for me to recover. It's the same experience for all of us. How I paint that picture is individually. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, go ahead. Typing, hang on. Oh. Um. Okay. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most empathetically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problem in the light of our experience can recover provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. So when they say in the light of our experience, do I have that experience yet? No. So they're going to show me where and how to find this power, this thing that created a change in their life. If I do exactly what they did, will I have the same experience they have? 100%. 100. Yeah. So then would I become a part of the collective? 100%. Once I've gone through this, then it's not my experience. It's our experience available to all of us. This is our solution. Yeah, it's the same fellowship of the Spirit, the same road uh, of happy to happy destiny. And that's where they say, as we understand it, is this power. And they're going to talk about where and how to get access to this power. That's the same for all of us, as we understand it. That's our common understanding. We don't get into... Your personal convictions and all, that's that's for matters for you to decide. But what we're explaining is this power is our dilemma. Lack of it is, and once we get access to it, it creates this change. Go ahead. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness honesty and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery but these are indispensable there is a principle which is a bar against all information which is proof against all arguments and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance that principle is contempt prior to investigation nobody Never here with that problem eh? <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's what that we need to have in order to recover. Because if we don't have this psychic change or spiritual experience, it's a change sufficient enough that removes the alcohol or removes alcoholism from my life, so I can start dealing with the human problem by applying these principles that answers all my problems. As long as alcoholism is still present, what's my fate? Relapse. So the most important thing that needs to happen in my life is what? I need to get access to this power that creates a shift in my life sufficient enough for me to recover. Otherwise, I'm doomed to an alcoholic death. So my life's got my attention here. And this thing, so they're not saying I need to have God in this step, do they? No. Do they say I have to have a relationship with God? No. 
They're saying lack of power is my dilemma. So they're going to go on to explain more. And they talk about how they got access to it to create this change. So they're going to talk more about it. So where and how am I to find this power? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Because you hear a lot of people looking for God. God's not lost, in case anybody's wondering. And if you don't believe, just stay tuned. You'll be contacted shortly. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> we're, back, we're back to page 45 then. Yes? Yes. <clears throat> well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Help you solve your problem or solve your problem? It will solve your problem. Why can't why why doesn't it need my help? Sorry, why? Why doesn't it need my help? Could I be more involved? No. Because no. if 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 I need to be involved, it's not gonna work, is it? I already said alcoholism is beyond my pay grade. I already admitted it's beyond me to deal with before and after. So I need something greater than me to remove it from my life. Because if it needed my help, then it's not enough, is it? Well, I'm my problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's keep reading. <laughs> yes. Okay. That means we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we are going to talk about God. Here, difficulty arises with agnostics. Many times we talk to a new man and watch his hope rise as we discuss his alcoholic problems and explain our fellowship. But his face falls when we speak of spiritual matters. So, so sorry, they're, they're doing still a clear distinction between the fellowship and the program. A lot of people still call the fellowship the program. It's a misleading statement, especially for those who are new. But what's really weird is some people, that is their program, just go to meetings and don't drink, right? That is their program. But our program and their program is in here. So remember, when we talk about the program or coming to the program, they're ta we're talking about in this, getting introduced to this thing, right? Because you can be in the fellowship for years and still not be in the program or have access to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or been through it. Anybody like that here? How many people are hoping that they really didn't need to do this? everybody's hands should go up, right? Most of us have to be convinced. Like, there's no other door. There's This is ain't Bob Barker, right? There, you don't get door number one, two, and three. It's one or two. And you're already in door number one, So we, right? Because we're already dying of alcoholism, so I need an alternative path, right? Because I'm here as the result. So I don't have alcoholism. Alcoholism has me. Big difference. It's making my decisions for me. It's ruining my life in spite of all my efforts not to, right? So we're going we're gonna to go kind of hit over to 46. Yes, we of alcohol, we of agnostic temperament. Yep. Yes, we of agnostic temperament have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results. Even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. So what's the basis, bare minimum, that we need to have to start this course of action? Willingness. Right? Because I'm, I'm, I need to be willing to believe that this will work for me. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, create this change through a course of action. So it's not about defining or my relationship with God. It's about getting access to this power. Because unless I get access to this power where I have an experience with it, where it's personal to me, I'm going to die an alcoholic death. Because I've had intellectual experiences with God, with religion, with spirituality, and I've always found myself still back drinking again. Like in early sobriety, the first time I got introduced to AA, I was 16. And they said, may you find them now. So I went and joined the Baptist church. And I'm in the choir. I'm going on like Mr. Bean. Like I'm happy. Things are fantastic. And then I'm drinking again. So I thought it was, must have been the Baptist church. So I joined the Nazarene. Right? And then we, we got real there. Like it, it was like, it was like, it was like the spirit of God happening there. 
right? And then I got drunk again, so now I'm really confused, right? Because, you know, I got God and I'm getting drunk all the time. What I didn't have was this power that they talked about where I got access to it, where it created a shift for me. So for guys like me, who are, I would say, a true believer, but not having this this kind of experience, when I got back to this stage, I, I went, okay, you know what? Like I've been in 11 years in and out. I believe that there is something. I don't know who or what you are, but I'm open to the experience. I'm open to going through this. Redefine yourself to me. Show me. Because all my ideas are getting me killed. I'm open to a new idea and a new experience. I did that 30, over, over 31 years ago. I said, show me. Right? And so it was willing to go through the rest of the course of action. Remember when Bill was sitting with Evie at the kitchen table? What was the only thing he needed to do the rest of the court to get what his friend got? Be willing to do what his friend did to get what he got. All he seen was a matter of being willing to believe. That was it. Nothing more was required for me to build what I saw in my friend. So we see this comes as the result of a course of action, not as, as a result of a singular act. Even if I did a surrender and I had a big, huge spiritual experience, I wouldn't be able to maintain it for any period of time because I wouldn't have the elements. I'd still have all the blocks. I'd, I wouldn't have the ability to maintain and develop this thing. Right, Because I've had a few spiritual experiences over my time, but I've never been able to maintain and develop it. So, let's head right over to page 47. We need to ask ourselves. Did you want to add anything, Joe? No, 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 not right now. So, 47, we need to ask ourselves. We needed to ask ourselves, but one short question. Do I now believe? Or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? <laughs> like, like you know what? Maybe you don't have to throw it. But are you even willing to be willing to believe? Like, like oh, let me think. Like, you mean to, to have a life beyond anything I could ever imagine? That these people said they got access to a power that created the promises, that made them happy, joyous, and free. And I could have this if I'm even just willing to be willing to believe. That's all that's required of me. I don't have to have this relationship. How many people have been to a meeting where they bring up step two and everybody starts talking about their relationship with God? That's not what step two is. Step two is the solution to step one. What is the solution to step one? Is a psychic change or spiritual experience that is accessible to us through a course of action. Believing that if I did what these people did, I'd get what they got. What confirms step two? What's the confirmation of the, of the, the possibility in step two? It's step 12. As the result. So we see this idea that it's possible. And then through this course of action. Is as the result of these steps. I've ha had this experience. Sufficient enough for me to recover. Having had a spiritual experience. As the result of these steps. Having what experience? The spiritual appendix in the back of the book. All I need to do at this stage of the game. Is to be willing that if it worked for all these people. Hundreds of thousands of people that went before me. And those that put the book together. And since thousands. Will it work? for me and by hopefully if you're working with somebody like joe kimberly myself you'll see that what we used to be like bill what we used to be what happened was this course of action and what we're like now right and i don't see no halos over our heads mine's close mine's blocked a bit but it, it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> the horns are holding it up it's it's not that bad of terms right so it's pretty cool we need to ask ourselves one short question are we asking the question again? Yeah, let's do it again. All right. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we empathetically ensure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. And we read the spiritual experience. Now we're building a spiritual structure. It's pretty well when you kind of look at that because the, spiritual, the structure we live in now is a little beaten up and not working too well. You want to add something to that, Joe? Well, you know, you gotta, how do you like being with you so far, right? Like, you ask yourself. 
without the solution, I see head shaking. <laughs> I don't like being with me anymore. Take it away. I, I see some of you just like, oh, shit. And, th and, and that's life run on self. That's life run on my own ideas. Me, and, and we hit up on it on 44 and 45. And from Mirko to Moles, better for so, uh, philosophies were sufficient enough, right? And so how many people, like Tony was saying, ended up at a church, a synagogue, a temple? How many people picked up, dropped the rock, or just read the 12 and 12 with a little red book? And it still didn't produce the psychic change or spiritual experience enough, right? How many of you stayed dry for years just fucking biting at the bit? You know, any little thing someone did, you were just fight or flight, ready to pounce or ready to run. You know, this is not a this is not a spiritual vessel that anybody would want to dwell in, would it be? Right? So th what this thing says and what it talks about later in the five when we get, it's kind of like you can be at peace and ease with this. Do you want this? Do you want to accept this? Or do you want to continue to go on to the bitter end? And it asks that, right? We have but two alternatives. It means that the course you're already on without this solution is doomed an alcoholic death, life without power. And they talk about those mental uh, um, inconsistencies with the utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity of the wish. They can't remember that pain and humiliation of e even a week, a month ago. And any idea that you come up with to justify a drink is plain insanity and you should be locked up. And that's kind of what the whole book's saying. So faced with alcoholic torture and destruction, coming willing to believe that I can have this and especially when someone presenting it to me is a demonstration of it, you got to ask yourself, do I, am I willing to believe? Right? And that was my experience, and that's why we're sitting here today doing this big book study. Thanks. So on page 50, you'll get into what a lot of people were talking about on the chat, and that's it. They start getting into the ideas of God and, and the religious belief and their spiritual belief or their teaching or dogma or what other people taught them and what they have struggling with. Most people struggle with other people's ideas or teachings and they're plagued with their own ideas. It, it's it's kind of like, you know, we try to be spiritual on one hand, but we're plagued with our consciousness and our thinking on the other hand. On one hand, we try to act spiritual, but we're tormented by the, the, the things with inside of ourselves that we can't make peace with. Anybody here like that? You go to a meeting, you talk about serenity, you talk about acceptance, you talk about all this thing, and, and you put on a good game, the chameleon, and you're acting spiritual and all that, and then your alone time is not good. Right? The, the, all this stuff is just, the, the consciousness is just like turmoil, right? And they're saying, so here we're talking about a different experience, something that's a little different. So on page 50 in our personal stories, they're talking about, we don't care about your religious, religious beliefs. It's not none of our business. What you need to understand is our solution, this power that we all got access to, that we're going to redefine what we mean by this power. They're very specific about it. Because if we got into, started talking about our religious ideas, this meeting would stop pretty fast. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It'd be a war. Right? But if we talk to the basis of the fundamental thing that's been available since the beginning of time, a power, this thing inside that they're going to more define and explain it better so we can go, wow, you know what? This thing has kind of been there all along. Wow, this is what people are talking about? This is what they got access to? I already have this in me. Yes, we're going to cultivate this thing that you already have, but you don't know you have it because nobody's been able to point it. It's like looking for your glasses when they're on your head. Pretty hard to see, right? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Which paragraph do you want me to start out on? In our personal stories. In our personal stories, you will find a wide variation in the way each teller approaches and conceives of the power which is greater than himself. Whether we agree with a particular approach or conception seems to make little difference. So, see, really, really, it's none of our business, right? I call it a frequency. Joan may call it creative intelligence. Um, uh, uh, Kimberly may call it, you know, Jehovah. Somebody else may call it Buddha. So, so if we got into those debates, we would be dead in the water. So we need to find a common denominator. Is this power? Lack of power is our dilemma. So they're saying each one of these people got access to a power. How they explain it is personal to them. But when they explain it, they'll explain the basis of it is available to all of us. That we all started at this point, no matter who you are. Go ahead. 
Experience has taught us that these are matters about which, for our purpose, we need not be worried. They are questions for each individual to settle for himself. On one proposition, however, these men and women are strikingly agreed. Every one of them has gained access to and believes in a power greater than himself. And that's where they say, as we understand, we all agree. It's collectively. We, this is our understanding. If you want what we have, you need to understand what we're talking about and get the same access to it. What is it that we have? We got access to a power that created this change. What is this book is about? Is getting access to that power that creates this change, enable the reader or the sufferer to recover from alcoholism. It's collectively. That's why they say, when you hear people, well, this guy, I believe this book was divinely put together. Right, And so when they say God as we understand him in step three and God as we understand him in step 11, they both talk about getting access to power and having experience with power by the time you get to 11. So what confirms step three is actually step 11. Step three is an idea of the possibility of this thing that we're getting into, that maybe I can have this thing. I go through a course of action and step 11 confirms the relationship or the experience with it. Go ahead. This power has, in each case, accomplished the miraculous, the humanly impossible. As a celebrated American statesman put it, let's look at the record. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude toward that power, and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. So what's those few simple things that they're talking about? The rest of the steps. Mm -hmm. The spiritual toolkit laid out their feet. They had to go through the course of action to experience what was available to them. Most people talk about this experience in step two and step three. If it was step two and step three, then we wouldn't need to do the rest of the steps, would we? If it was about our relationship in step two, about our relationship with God, and we had this relationship, then we wouldn't need to have that discussion, would we? I'd be experiencing the psychic change of spiritual experience. Whatever I've been doing up to this point in time, my beliefs, my teaching, my doctrine, whatever, is not working sufficient enough for me to have the same experience of these people that went before me. I'm still plagued with me. And I keep turning back to drink again in spite of my efforts not to. Nobody has that experience here, eh? And they're saying that doesn't have to be our story anymore. Right? We can have the same collective experience of those that went before us. That's the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's available to all of us, not just some of us, all of us. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Right? Sim let's, simple things. Here are thousands. Moses, hit it up there again. Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude toward that power and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. In the face of collapse and despair, in the face of total failure of their human resources, they found that a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Once confused and baffled by the seemingly futility of existence, they show the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. Leaving aside the drink question, they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them. When many hundreds of people are able to say that the consciousness of the presence of God is today the most important fact of their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. This world of ours has made more material progress in the last century than in all the millenniums which went before. Almost everyone knows the reason. Students of ancient history tell us that the intellect of men in those days was equal to the best of today. Yet in ancient times, material progress was painfully slow. The spirit of modern scientific inquiry, research and invention was almost unknown. 
In the realm of the material, men's minds were fettered by superstition, tradition, and all sorts of fixed ideas. Some of the contemporaries of Columbus thought a round earth preposterous. Others came near putting Galileo to death for his astronomical heresies. So, so they're talking about here, if we, these people would have say, stayed with the same mindset and not stepped out of it, we wouldn't have the experience that we would be, ha be having today in the world. Minus the virus, obviously, but technology, modem the modem, how far we've come in the last hundred years is pretty remarkable. So they're asking us, if we go to page 52, they're kind of getting ready to ask us the same thing. How well have you been doing with your thinking? So the agnostic, the true believer, and, and the atheist are all having problems with their thinking. They can't have the change necessary to bring about this spiritual experience or psychic change. Whichever one you're more comfortable with, they haven't been able to experience this change sufficient enough for them to recover because a lot of us are fixed with our own ideas. We're very, when we hear something contrary to our belief system or our own ideas, how many people start getting a little agitated? Any good drywallers here? <laughs> yeah, so we get agitated. We get, like, as long as you're telling me what I want to hear, I'm, I'm as open-minded <laughs> as anybody. Anybody? But if you go against what my sponsor taught me or what these people taught me or the fellowship taught me and go against my own belief system based on facts, I start getting a little irritable. Anybody? So here they're saying... So we're stuck on one idea. We have our own idea. So here's a really good, on page 52, we had to ask ourselves. We had to ask ourselves why we shouldn't apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Was not a basic solution of these bedevilments more important than whether we should see newsreels of lunar flight? Of course it was. Okay, so is this alcoholism that they're talking about or the human condition? Human well, let's, condition. Let's see what they say. So you hear people talk about the... the, the the bedevilments almost sound like bitty 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 porky pig there for a second. <laughs> you hear people talk about the bedevilments in the fellowship and make reference to them as this is untreated alcoholism or this is alcoholism, right? Well, actually, everybody's on board here and, and they're all saying the human condition. Yeah, so because there's only two symptoms in alcoholism. Right? Unless I find a solution to my human condition, what is the likelihood of the malady representing itself? 100%. What's the step one promise is I'm going to relapse again. So I need to be pretty open minded to find another way of living because it's just a matter of time before I pick up again because my illness is not in the parking lot doing push ups. But I've since recovered since I got taken through this 31 years ago. So I was in that position. So I, all I had most of the time was one point of view. Now they're giving me another point of view to kind of weigh out and look at, right? My, my sponsor Chuck always says, I need to always be prepared for two points of view because if I only have one point of view, I'm going to be stuck, right? That's why the serenity prayer is so powerful because it asks you to pause, quiet yourself, and look for an alternative answer than the one you have that's causing you trouble. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference so when i'm stuck the ability to pause pray and seek other alternatives other than the one i'm struggling with is a pretty powerful thing and that's what they're asking us to kind of do here and I, am i willing to change my point of view so i could have a different experience because who's created my experience so far other than alcoholism who's creating my human experience and the more I apply self to self, the worse it gets. Anybody finding that to be true? How many people get really, gets really painful, you working on you? <laughs> yeah. It's like a man beating himself with a hammer to take the headache away. <laughs> yeah. Of course it was. When? When we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. 
our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. And we have a fellowship. It's like God's portfolio. Like when you go to this, this chat room is like God's portfolio. It's like these people used to be this way. Now they're sitting in here participating in this. And a lot of people have recovered. They have a different experience as the, as what, as the result of this course of action. You mean to tell me that you used to have your own cell observation camera in jail, like institutions, all this other puking green bar. Now you're living a life beyond anything you could ever imagine. You're 31 years old, which is a phenomena in itself. What enables me to do that is my connection with a power greater than myself. What enables Kimberly to live the way? What enables Joe to live? What enables some of you have experienced this change as the result of getting access to this power? How many people would say, yes, this is true. My life is 100% different as the result of this course of action given to me. And none of this was my idea. I came up with none of this. None of this. I would have never came up with this in a thousand years. How many people sat in the bar and go, oh, look, I think you're suffering from the phenomenon of craving. That's why you drink the way you do. I've never had a friend say that to me. Or the other friend, I thought you were quitting last Friday. It looks like the malady returned, eh, Tony? <laughs> or Tony? You'd be so much happier, Tony, if you just applied a bit of spiritual principles to your life so you could have an entire second change of spiritual experience. They'll answer all your problems and actually become a nice guy and be able to, right, like, how many people's friends here were talking like that? No. So this idea, we come to the fellowship, we see m the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous all over the place. We had to quit doubting that these people said they were like me. They went through this thing and it's sufficient enough to bring about this change and this is available to me. Yeah, okay. I think this, I think I'm willing to believe that this will work for me. Pretty, pretty wild stuff. So you know what a portfolio is. Hey, you ever see an artist, they open their portfolio? AA is God's portfolio. Like, you know, when you walk by, you say, well, look what we did for Kimberly. And you go, wow. Say, no, 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 but look at Joe. <laughs> like, Joe. <laughs> like, <laughs> we know that's something greater than himself. Just look at him, right? Yeah. You ever hear that guy? That's God working in his life, right? I sponsor him, so it's okay. Go ahead. I love you, Joe. Go ahead. When? What? We'll start with when. That's worth reading again. You might want to highlight okay. that. Okay. When we saw others solve their spiritual problems by a simple reliance upon the spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas wow. did not work, but the God idea did. The Wright brothers almost childish faith that they could build a machine which would fly was the mainstream of their accomplishment. Without that, nothing could have happened. We agnostics and atheists were sticking to the idea that self-sufficiency would solve our problems. When others showed us that God's sufficiency worked with them, we began to feel like those who insisted the rights would never fly. Logic is great stuff. We liked it. We still like it. It is not by chance we were given the power to reason, to examine the evidence of our senses, and to draw conclusions. That is one of man's magnificent attributes. We, agnostically inclined, would not feel satisfied with a proposal which does not lend itself to reasonable approach and interpretation. Hence, we are at pains to tell why we think our present faith is reasonable, why we think it more sane and logical to believe than not to believe, why we say our former thinking was soft and mushy when we threw up our hands in doubt and said, we don't know. When we became alcoholics, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could not postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that either God is everything or he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. What? was our choice to be. So this is where a lot of people bastardize the book and take that one paragraph and start, well, what's my, dis they're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're going to explain what they mean by that. And they're going to expand on that idea because it's not black and white like that. Where a lot of people say, well, God either is or isn't. What's your choice to be? They say, relax, just kind of relax. Let, let us go into explaining more what we mean by this shift in our thinking, by willing to look at things differently, and what we mean by this power and where this power is. Arrived at this point. Arrived at this point, we were squarely confronted with the question of faith. 
we couldn't duck the issue. Some of us had already walked far over the bridge of reason toward the desired shore of faith. The outlines and the promise of the new land had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands had stretched out in welcome. We were grateful that reason had brought us so far, but somehow we couldn't quite step ashore. Perhaps we had been leaning too heavily on reason that last mile, and we did not like to lose our support. That was natural, but let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? So what they're saying you- is, so we're all here on this page, we're some result of some idea that we spent energy moving toward to create a different change in our life. First time we went to a meeting or truth, we kind of looked at, we, we kind of looked at our lives and said, something's got to give here. We had, most of us had two alternatives, either go on or I'm going to go to a meeting or try to save my job or relationship or my life. There's some, some form of reasoning that we went to our first meeting. Anybody? It's usually based on consequences or an alternative. Most of us don't think it's a good idea. We don't wake up and say, well, well, I think I'll just check off that part of my bucket list now that I made in junior kindergarten, hit my first AA meeting. Usually there's no other place to go. Usually it's because somebody's looking at us and they're giving us that look and we've given them every excuse there is known to to us and then something in our mouth goes, I'll go to a meeting. And we go, I <laughs> can't take it back. Some of us are here as a result of other people's efforts. Anybody that had to talk us into going to a meeting or going to treatment to save or to participate in saving our own lives? We need to be convinced on doing that. That's that's something in itself, right? So you look at reason, then you put effort or your energy into trying to create the shift, but we're unable to do so not at the depths necessary, right? And that's what they're getting at here. The desired shore of faith, the outlines and promises of the new land had brought luster to tired eyes and fresh courage to flagging spirits. Friendly hands stretched out welcome. And that's like, that's us, you know, presenting this idea to you, right? This new power, this new way, this new idea, this God idea. How you're going to attain that is through this process, having faith that if I do what you're doing or what Tony's done, if I if I put the faith that I could have the same experience, this inner resource tapping into it, do I have the faith that if I do the but reason got me here, but am I going to practice this willingness, this open-mindedness, and this humility, and the, and, and this, this honesty to pursue it, right? That was natural, but let us think a little more closely. Without knowing it, had we not been brought to where we stood by a certain kind of faith? Or did we not believe in our own reasoning? Did we not have confidence in our ability to think? What was that but a sort of faith? Yes, we had been faithful objectly faithful to the God of reason. So in one way or another, we discovered that faith had been involved all the time. We found too that we had been worshipers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. Had we not variously worshiped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves. And then with a better motive, had we not worshipfully beheld the sunset, the sea, or a flower? So what does worship mean? Is where you spend your energy and your thinking. How many people spend a lot of energy and thinking on what's going to make them better, if this was different, if that was different, if only, right? That's where you spend your energy. So right now we're spending our energy in something that's not working for us. How many people spend their energy in fear, resentment, harms, anticipating the future, the past, the world around us? Where we spend our energy, the things that consume your mind is what you worship or to believe to be true. If I continue to put stock into my ideas, my fears, my beliefs, then how is my solution towards this new power going to be if I'm involved with it with this kind of thinking? And kind of page 60 will allude to the fact that any life run on self can hardly be a success. Basically, all the beliefs and worships and all these things that you've been implementing in your own individual life is a sum result of got you sitting here mixed with alcoholism right everything you've done to try to combat that we see on 54 that we are directed by something belief system so here they're asking us to kind of shift what that is and so 
where's their understanding of where this power is, right? So if I'm going to get, so a lot of us know where we want to go. We want to get the psychic change or spiritual experience. I believe that there is something for me, but I need a starting point, right? Like a GPS, right? When you punch in the coordinates in the GPS, what's the second thing it does once it you get your coordinates in? It locates where you are. So you need a starting point continuously. So all the way through this, the, the basis of this thing, I need to always have a starting point to recreate or regroup or, or to revisit or to, to go from. So on page 55, they talk about actually. Where and how were we to find this thing? They're going to give us the recipe on where it is. Actually. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. For deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man itself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. We can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. This attitude you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. So they give, they're giving us a, an exercise there. Anybody know what that exercise is? There's an actual exercise that most people haven't done through we agnosis. It's the starting point of this whole thing. Right? Anybody want to get, get, uh, guess what that exercise is? Is to see this consciousness, this thing that's always been there. It's it been in. Actually, we're fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured in every single one of us, not some of us. So this thing is there. How do they ask you to kind of look at it? Well, we do an exercise to see if it was kind of always there. How many people here has ever thought about somebody and then they phoned you? Right? It's kind of weird. How many people here at their darkest moment, something inside gave you an answer to something? Or somebody showed up? How many people here had a voice, that intu a little voice deep down within at different times in their life when they were a kid? So what, what my sponsor got me to do is go back over my life and see how many times this unexplainable entity, this voice, this thing has been there long before I suspected it. So one time I remember I went home. I don't know how I got home, where I was or what happened, but I came to in the basement with this voice saying, don't fall asleep on your back. In other words, because I would have died of asphyxiation, right? So, so I turned over, and so, you know, vomit and all that other stuff. So I would, how many times have there been that kind of voice in my life where I can't put my finger on it, but it kind of showed up. I can't remember anything about anything, but I remember this voice telling me, don't go here, do this, do that, mm -hmm. phone nut, or in my darkest hour of despair, somebody showed up or something phoned or something happened to intervene. How many times in my life has that been there? That's what they're talking about. This is what we mean by power greater than ourselves. This is where we get access to this. Is deep down in every single one of us. This is where the relationship and the experience starts. It starts from within. It moves from my mind to something that's already existing within inside of me. And you're going to give me the route to get back to that so I get access to this power so I can have a different experience in my life than the one I've been having it. How, you know those days when you kind of wake up and you're in tuned with everything? You ever notice everything looks brighter? You notice anybody been there? And then you wake up some days and just it's dark. It's so dark that you think today's the day. What's the difference between those two days? It's something inside of you that creates a shift, right? How many people felt unbelievable hope here at different times? How many people felt unbelievable despair here? I mean, dark despair. I mean, incomprehensible demoralization. Where the snot's running out of your nose and you feel like you're buckled over in pain. You know that pain that comes out of your chest? Not in your, in your thinking. That pain that is like daggers going right through you. 
and then something happens where you have a bit of hope? How many people have, how do you explain that, that shift? They're, so they're saying here, we're going to give you the ability to access this on a more consistent basis where it doesn't have to be under circumstances anymore. Right? How many people have to go to a meeting just to get their head screwed on right? So in the meeting, you get a bit of hope, you get a bit of thing, where you have to go somewhere and kind of get relaxed or get access or tap in to the fellowship of the Spirit, and you get some access to create some shift by something you do that creates a shift where you're able to kind of be within your own company. Here they're saying they're going to show you how to do this to get rid of the calamity, and obscured by calamity. Anybody know what doesn't what's calamity the noise within your own mind that we're used to we're used to the marching band up there we're living beside the railway tracks and the airport and we've got a marching band we're used to the noise remember in bill's story how how use how how much was bill used to the noise in his own mind what what scared the living crap out of bill that he had to phone his friend. When he experienced serenity and peace. At a level that he never experienced before. He was alarmed by the sense of well-being. Like the, the wind blew through and through. That he had to phone his friend the doctor. And the doctor said. Whatever it is you're going. You better hang on to it. And that seems to be the collective experience. Of everybody who's gone through this. So where is this power reside. That we need to get access to. Let's ask the chat. Where does everybody think this power is? So the second question, how many people would have came up with that as their idea of a power greater than themselves? That it was deep down within. I, I wouldn't have came up with that idea. If, you, if you've answered deep down within, you are correct. When they explained that to me and then they gave me that exercise to go back over my life, I kind of went, wow, yeah, you know what? I think this is going to be all right. I want some more of this stuff. Okay, you want to uh, keep going, Kim? Absolutely. In this book, you will read the experience of a man who thought he was an atheist. His story is so interesting that some of it should be told now. His change of heart was dramatic, convincing, and moving. Our friend was a minister's son. He attended church school where he became rebellious at what he thought an overdose of religious education. For years thereafter, he was dogged by trouble and frustration. Business failure, insanity, fatal illness, suicide. These calamities in his immediate family embittered and depressed him. Post-war disillusionment, ever more serious alcoholism, impending medical, mental and physical collapse brought him to the point of self-destruction. One night, when confined in a hospital, he was approached by an alcoholic who had known a spiritual experience. Our friend's gorge rose as he bitterly cried out, If there is a God, he certainly hasn't done anything for me. But later, alone in his room, he asked himself this question. Is it possible that all the religious people I have known are wrong? While pondering the answer, he felt as though he lived in hell. Then, like a thunderbolt, a great thought came. It crowded out all else. Who are you to say there is no God? This man recounts that he tumbled out of bed to his knees. In a few seconds, he was overwhelmed by a conviction of the presence of God. It poured over and through him with the certainty and majesty of a great tide at flood. The barriers he had built through the years were swept away. He stood in the presence of infinite power and love. He had stepped from bridge to shore. For the first time, he lived in the conscious companionship with his creator. Thus was our friend's cornerstone fixed in place. No later vistitude has shaken it. His alcoholic problem has disappeared. Save for a few brief moments of temptation, the thought of drink has never returned. And at such times, a great revulsion has risen up in him. Seemingly, he could not drink even if he would. God had restored his sanity. What is this but a miracle of healing? Yet its elements are simple. Circumstances made him willing to believe. <laughs> he humbly offered himself to his maker. Then he knew. Even so, had God restored us all to our right minds. To this man, the revelation was sudden. Some of us grow into it more slowly. 
but he has come to all who have honestly sought him. When we draw near to him, he disclosed himself to us. We're done. So this week, read uh, how it works. Joe, did you want to do a cap over this? A small summary? Uh, yeah, I always hit it up with, uh, you know, when they asked us on 47. Go back to there. We needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I willing to, or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? And, uh, you know, if, I, if I've been running on the idea that I, I am power and I put all these prestiges and, and I've even, even my calamity, and maybe some of you have felt the same, that our own calamity, we're driving factors in our life to either do better, do good. Have I used them for good? Have I used them for worse? My resentments, have they been driven for revenge? Have they been driven? It's all these kind of type things, right? I've been living on some sort of idea of faith that if I, if I do these things, I'll get it. It's like if you go to the gym, you're going to get physically fit. If you quit smoking, you'll get healthier. If you apply the steps, you might recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I don't want to do that. I just want to keep coming to meetings. I just want to put faith in the meetings and stuff like this. And this is that contempt prior to investigation. I'm going to hold true to my ideas and what I think, right? What I think may work or what I think may, may, you know, like you get, you get, I've seen some stuff in the chat today and it, and it's, it kind of hits the heartstring, but it's like some of you from, from what your answers are, it, you know, it's a lot of the fellowship jargon that we hear. If you're of this type and the books talk specifically to this type, that if you are the alcoholic who, if you honestly want to and find you cannot quit entirely, where if when drinking you have little or no con control, then you are going to be doomed a certain way, right? And, Sometimes I, I, don't, I don't like to get in the doomy gloomy after we've just talked a lot about hope and faith and the way we just have, but this is what launched me into believing that. I came to believe that the hopelessness and futility of the life that I'd been living it, I came to believe that there was nothing I was ever going to be humanely do or anybody for me possible to, 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 to rec at the time I believed, cure me, right? Because I was brand new and I was just like, there's got to be something. All the bad I've been carrying with me throughout, you know, my, my human condition. I've been dragging it around, dragging, lugging it around. My reaction, like I talked about earlier, the fight or flight, these are all these ideas that have to be cast aside. And, and we we'll talk about that when we get to the fifth step, right? These are suddenly cast to one side and then a whole new conceptions that seem to dominate them, right? And that's a matter of doing this. And so we're really putting in faith the fact that if I'm going to continue on doing the fourth, all the way through this is the faith that i'll have this experience as a result right and so that's just you know i'm still new I'm, I'm only two and a half years sober i'm still learning i gotta ask tony all the time what certain things mean so how i explain it and how 31 years explains it it's just i'm at where i'm at in my spiritual connection right now and, and it's been a ride man and this is nothing i could have done on my own I, I i was sitting in my car with hoses attached to it the day i came back so so Certainly the question now. is, yeah. I still don't understand how atheism, atheism works here. So if you go to page 59, we see on step one, we see what the problem is, right? Right? Left to our own devices, that is going to continue yeah. to happen. Can... So step two says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, right? Through a course of action as the result of these steps. So we see from 3 to 12 is bringing about this change. We see in we agnostics, all it is is a matter to be willing to believe that there is a power grid and stuff, and they have access to this thing with inside of them. They don't have to call it God. That even atheists can have this, this intuitiveness, that this power that's deep down within them, that kind of how they define is entirely up to them, but there's something inside that governs them. They believe that they don't believe. They spend all that, that energy defending their non-belief system but that's their belief system 